Hello, everybody who is with us here today. As we present this report on migration from Huehuetenango, Guatemala, which offers some clear proposals to deal with migration as a phenomenon. Today, by the Mayan calendar, corresponds to the, the energy that is a traveler's, which is to say that the word migrant as such doesn't exist in Mayan languages, although it's recognized in the history of these native peoples, the movement of people, which includes the native movement as part of their resistance. Borders have not been created by these peoples, they've been imposed. I would like to start by giving thanks for being given this opportunity to share ideas, especially to our colleagues from MPI. They have been the primary driver of this research. I think that we have had great collaboration and have offered different perspectives. I am the director of Asociación POPNO, and we appreciate that MPI took our perspective into account. POPNO is a Guatemalan civil society organization that has a focus on indigenous peoples, which is to say that we work with Mayan populations with a focus on indigenous peoples, both individually and collectively that have a history that spans thousands of years, rich culture, and have a specific means of understanding the world and living in it. Our ideal is the good life, a concept that native people have of living simply and modestly in balance and in harmony between mother nature, the universe and humanity. This is well-being, both individual and collectively, materially and spiritually. We see ourselves as partners in processes in which the primary actors are people and communities. We work with different programs, especially working with women, youth, and others to give them a central role socially, economically, and politically to face different forms of violence, such as structural violence, racism, discrimination, and other forms of exclusion. This focus on indigenous communities is what led us to, began, to begin dealing with migration in the year 2010. As such, in our work, we frequently came across migration in people's daily lives. The majority of Guatemalan migrants are indigenous and the Department of Huehuetenango is where we focused. This is one of the primary areas that produces migrants. Migration is deeply affecting the lives of these communities, especially at a family and a broader community level. The social fabric is tearing. And as such, we can't talk about indigenous people in Guatemala without talking about migration. Our position institutionally has been to recognize the right to migrate, the right to not migrate, and the right to a dignified return to one's country. Migration is not negative per se. It's a part of human's history. What has been negative has been the way that states have dealt with migration, which has generally been with a focus on control, arrest, and deportation, and not human safety. One of our strategic objectives is to contribute methodologically and theoretically in this process of managing Mayan migration, creating synergies with other actors in their struggles. This leads us to investigation and the exchange of ideas. The fact that we are able to work with MPI in this fluid way allows us to contribute 
our bit of this. And it's been a very rich collaboration that has allowed us to complement each other's efforts. MPI offers their knowledge and experience as far as migration and also offers the ability to synthesize or um, understand methodology. We offer our knowledge on the ground, our perspective about these indigenous peoples and our grassroots work with these people in terms of human migration, specifically helping returned youth in these communities. We hope that this information in today's presentation will be useful for those of you joining us so that we can all find ways of dealing with migration that puts human dignity first. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juan Jose. Um, it has been a, a true pleasure to work with you and Pop Nok and Raquel, Silvia Raquel, who's here as well um, on this report, and of course, my colleague Luis Argueta. Um, first, a, a housekeeping note, if you need translation, I'm going to switch into Spanish in a minute. If you need translation um, or interpretation, go to your meeting controls, click the interpretation icon at the bottom of the screen. And um, if it's sometimes in the more option on a phone or a tablet, and then click the language that you want to listen in. Um, and if you have technical problems, please email us at events at migrationpolicy.org or call 202-266-1929. And we will have questions and answers at the end of this, uh, well, actually in the middle of this discussion. Um, and uh, you can go into the Q&A box. There's a box that says questions and answers, Q&A, and that you can actually type in your questions. So, cam changing into Spanish, cambiando al español. Uh, mi nombre es Andrew Sili, soy presidente de... My name is Andrew Sili, and I'm the president of the... Migration Policy Institute, MPI. It's been a pleasure to be able to work with Bofno, Silvia, and Juan Jose in this effort. And so welcome to this event, understanding the factors behind unregulated migration from Guatemala. This is a key part of uh, work that we do on regional migration, which is Im immigration from Canada to Costa Rica. Uh, looking at it as a joint system in which different countries are tied by human mobility. Luis Soto, who is also joining us, coordinates this work for MPI. We have focused on four topics, humanitarian protection, legal pathways, as we say in English, for possibilities for legal migration, management of migration, and finally, uh, the issue of investment and development, and especially the role of migrants themselves as actors in development. MPI is also part of a work group for North America and Central America on immigration, which has been convened by uh, the Refugee and Migrants Council in Canada, among others. In today's webinar, we will be discussing the results of our research report that we carried out between MPI and POPNO, which is called Migration from Huehuetenango in the Western Highlands, uh, Public Policy Responses and Development. We documented a lot, but also did field work to offer this snapshot. And this report was thanks to the generous support of the United States government through USAID and thanks to our collaboration with IOM. The content of this report does not necessarily reflect the viewpoint of USAID, the US government or IOM. It reflects the author's perspective but we thank USAID and IOM for the opportunity to carry out this research and soon we'll hear from the mission director for USAID in Guatemala, as well as the chief of party from IOM who will be discussing their big project they have going on in Guatemala about immigration. So you'll hear from Anu and Claudio shortly who are joining us today. And so without any further ado for now, I will hand the floor over to Luis Argueta. Luis was really the, the focal point of all of this. He is a great colleague 
Uh, he's a very recognized filmmaker, both in Guatemala, in the US and throughout the world, but it's also been our pleasure to work with him in different research projects. And we really appreciate uh, his willingness to deal with topics that MPI is researching. And so Luis, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you for those uh, words, Juan Jose. It's been an honor to work with MPI and Bofno and to collaborate on this study that I hope will be useful for many of you. So we'll now watch a short film about migration, which is produced by Fred Tisitavian Aroldo Mateo from Bofno's communications unit. Migration Voices, Huevetenango, Guatemala. Migration is not new in Huevetenango, one of Guatemala's departments with the highest unauthorized migration to the United States. We don't have a house. This is my father's house, mother of a returned child. Our child has had health issues with his feet since birth and we couldn't build anything. He has issues with his feet. Uh, people leave out of necessity, not to seek riches. If we were rich here, why would we go bother anyone there? This is the grandmother of a returned child. Right now, we can't even find work. At times, we don't have money to eat. So I ask my children, how are we going to eat? For many families in this region, unauthorized migration is a lifeline and an increasingly common option to seek better opportunities in life. However, this also puts migrants in significant danger. It separates families and has a negative impact on children. Mother of a returned girl. She left with my husband because we have nothing to eat. I better go so my father can achieve something for us, she said. I'm going to leave, she said. And then my father will send me back. And so that was their intention when they left. A year later, she was deported back here. He was at a shelter after he crossed the border into the U.S. with my husband. He was there for about a week and then in immigration custody for two weeks, two days, I think. And our child was crying and crying. And then a man from Honduras gave him his aluminum blanket so that our child could be warmer. But he kept crying. As soon as they crossed the border, they separated our boy from his father. He spent seven months at a shelter in California. And my daughter was locked up for three months along the border, and then they threw her back to Guatemala. And so that's how it went. I was very sad thinking that my little girl left. I didn't eat just thinking she wasn't here. And all she did was cry over there. They separated me from my father in immigration. It was a lot of pressure because they said, you'll be out in 15 days and I would never get out. You'll be out in a month and they wouldn't release me. Two months went by, three months went by. And then seven months later, I finally asked for a voluntary departure because I didn't know what else to do. She would pull her hair out, big chunks of hair out of anger. I don't know what was going on with her. And so one leaves out of necessity for one's children. We wouldn't go. We've been through this, but 
the little ones are just beginning their lives. Our son is better now, but now his eyesight is another matter. They were provided some food. My son Wilmer was, not just for him, but a little bit of that was for me. And so I'm thinking of continuing my schooling. My sister and I are going to try to make a go of it here. You can download the report at www.migrationpolicy.org, the website below. And in English, in English at the site just shown. So this video reminds us that to see the human face of migration, there's nothing more valuable than being face to face with the people who are actually living that phenomenon in their daily lives and then hear their testimony. I will now give a, re a summary of the report that it, I've been able to contribute to along with Andrew and Juan Jose and the rest of the team from both MPI and POPNO. I will try to contextualize the report, explain the methodology that we employed, and then give our primary findings and recommendations. The increase of unauthorized migration from Guatemala to the U.S. over the last 10 years has been significant. It's calculated that there are almost a million and a half Guatemalans in the United States today. A 44% increase from 2013. And a vast majority of this migration is coming from the Western Highlands in Guatemala, which is a region that is among the poorest and most rural in Guatemala. Migration from Huehuetenango and the Western Highlands are responses to public policy. Um, and this study seeks to understand the trends and the drivers of this migration from this region, which has the greatest flow in the Western Highlands. The importance of that unauthorized migration as a lifeline is reflected in the amount of remittances sent to Guatemala, which during COVID increased from $10.5 billion in 2019 to $15.3 billion in 2021, which is 42 million dollars per day that arrive in Guatemala. Remittances in 2020 almost equaled all exports in the country and substantially surpassed government revenue and will certainly surpass both of these figures in 2021. The study carried out by the Migration Policy Institute and BOPNO showed our long presence in this region. We examined examining existing literature and had groups doing field work. We were able to carry out visits carried out by Ernesto Alejandro Ramirez on behalf of the Popno Association in May and June of 2021. Our, we were able to interview community leaders, service providers, leaders of NGOs, former migrants, among others. In each of four municipalities of Huehuetenango, Jacaltenango, San Ildefonso, Itzahuacan, San Pedro Necta, and Unión Cantinil. These four municipalities were selected because they are exporters of a lot of migrants. They are near the border with Mexico, and as such, they are transit hubs for migrants. And they have both economic and ethnocultural diversity between mestizos and Maya people. These interviews carried out in June of 2021 uh, were carried out by Luis Argueta, Juan Jose Hurtado, and Andrew Seely. During that trip, researchers visited the following places in Huehuetenango, Chancla, San Antonio Huista, Huehuetenango, Jacaltenango, La Mesilla, and met with community leaders, service providers, public authorities in each of those places. Beyond this research and field visits, researchers generally, Andrew and myself, 
I spoke to people in Guatemala who have broad experience in different aspects of migration and development. This happened in May and August of 2021. Some of those conversations were for this project specifically, and others were group discussions carried out at the at Flaxo, among other think tanks and research institutions in country, including the Universidad Rafael Andigón. Others were conversations that were carried out for other projects that led us to think about this report. We had over 50 in-depth interviews with stakeholders, both locally and nationally. COVID has made interviews and trips harder than in the past, but we were able to carry out the majority of these interviews in person. A central finding of this study is that people in Huehuetenango feel a deep sense of rootedness in their local communities. And this is not necessarily more true in indigenous communities, or this is found in indigenous communities that have maintained a strong sense of unique identity through longstanding collective decision-making processes. Although to some extent, these processes exist in all of the communities that we have studied, not all of which are majority indigenous. Existing community structures and that strong sense of belonging represents important social assets that can be leveraged in efforts to create alternatives at a local level to migration. Our research found that immigration or that migration from Huehuetenango is overwhelmingly driven by poverty and a lack of economic opportunity, violence, corruption, discrimination, and scant access to basic services and nutrition also play an important role in spurring migration. Not every municipality has the same rates of emigration, and there are patterns that show people going, moving internally within Guatemala or to Mexico, but nonetheless, once immigration to the United States begins, it quickly becomes an available strategy for a wide range of families, including the poorest families who use support from strong social networks abroad. It's likely that this migration from the Western Highlands and Huehuetenango will continue indefinitely. For many families, this is the best way to improve their standard of living. And as such, it has become a strategy that is increasingly common in many communities. On the other hand, unauthorized migration also exposes migrants to significant risks. It divides families and communities and negatively affects children. Nonetheless, there are a series of approaches that over time could help to better manage migration and provide local alternatives to emigration. And they include the following. There are I would like to point out, building out legal migration pathways as alternatives to irregular movement. Creating legal pathways for migration would help to ensure that more of that movement be carried out in a safe, orderly, and regular manner. Policymakers should ex actively explore ways of expanding pathways to legal migration that would allow people to move in a more circular fashion between Guatemala and other countries, especially the United States, but also including Canada and Mexico. Doing so would allow people to earn money abroad, but remain connected to their communities in Guatemala at the same time that they are able to meet key labor market needs in their destination country. This could be the single most important issue to address in the short term when it comes to managing irregular migration from Guatemala. A good indicator of the attention that is being uh, paid to this issue by the gov Guatemalan government is the presentation that was offered yesterday by the president, along with ministers from the Ministry of Work and Foreign Relations, asking for a, a registry of people who are interested in working outside of Guatemala. Next point, 
Developing social and economic infrastructure in local communities. This strong sense of belonging in many of these communities in the Western Highlands means that most people would rather not migrate if provided other alternatives. Let's remember what the grandmother says in this video. If we were self-sufficient here, we wouldn't go and bother anyone anywhere else. Some development interventions are essential long-term strategies like improving access to education and medical care, while others may help address the specific push factors for migration, such as giving access to low-cost credit or the services for domestic violence. Our third point is investing in local actors as agents of change, engaging local leaders and organizations, as well as migrants abroad who remain connected to their home communities, and also returning migrants. It makes eminent sense in development strategies to address pressures that drive people to migrate. This should balance the need for large scale change with it and investments in many communities with an approach that builds capacity, accountability, and solutions from the grassroots up. Understanding the reasons why people migrate is critical, both for finding ways of created safe, orderly, and regular pathways for mobility, and also for reducing pressures to migrate in the future by creating greater opportunities beyond migration. While there is no single strategy to make this happen, approaches that build on existing social capital leadership and networks make these efforts more productive and more likely to succeed. In closing, I would like to mention two key lessons from the research process. Cultural and linguistic competency is key to understanding migration in the Western Highlands. And two, there is an urgent need to go beyond reports and to find more dynamic ways of sharing results and research findings. Films, podcasts, graphic representations, or articles based on stories that capture the nuances of these issues that are at play talking about immigration. And so it's a great pleasure for me now to introduce Cardinal Alvaro Ramasini. And before introducing him, I would like to say that after these speakers, we'll have a time for question and answers, and that while the presentations are going on, you, the audience, are in, encouraged to write your questions in the question and answer box. And so allow me to now introduce Cardinal Álvaro Ramesini, the third cardinal in Guatemala's history and bishop for Huehuetenango since 2012. By means of introduction, I would like to say that it's been my privilege to accompany the cardinal um, through the high all of the back roads and byways of this area um, through Guatemala along the Mexican border and then in Mississippi after immigration rates in 2019. We have done um, pastoral work with migrants in the St. Patrick's Cathedral, as well as the desert of Arizona. All of these times I have witnessed his compassion and solidarity with migrants, um, his profound concern for the environment and his fight for both peace and social justice, which is so necessary today. Go ahead, Cardinal. Thank you very much. A warm greeting for everyone who's taking part in this uh, encounter. The topic of migration uh, as it regards Huehuetenango toward the United States is a topic that is global in reach. That is to say, we have to raise awareness about this problem. This is a worldwide issue. Now, in that regard, there are two large players uh, that we are talking about. The country that unfortunately expels uh, migrants, in this case, Guatemala, its own uh, children. And I use and and am adamant about the term expel because it's not that people are just uh, taking uh, time off uh, to take a vacation in the United States and then there's the country that receives them and the policies that we've had thus far 
from uh, the different U.S. governments that have not been a very welcoming policies, welcoming, yes, for some sectors of migrants, scientists, people with, who are highly skilled uh, are more than welcome. Uh, they don't encounter many difficulties to get their visas, but those who wash dishes in restaurants, who pick fruit or engage in harvesting, these are the ones uh, that have the hardest time integrating uh, into a society that's entirely uh, unknown to them, starting with the uh, difficulties of language. Now, a consequence or a conclusion I draw from this, and hopefully that this uh, report will express as much, is uh, for us to uh, understand fully that this is a global responsibility, and that means that we cannot overlook a key uh, aspect, and that is the human dimension. The United States is defined itself as a secular society, but most people in the United States are Christians, be they Catholic or other. Many, uh, most are Protestants. Guatemala, constitutionally, is not a constitutionally uh, religious uh, country, but uh, still mostly Christian, Catholics and non-Catholics. And so from that uh, Christian uh, standpoint, I raise something that has been raised throughout history, just how far do those human values that are enshrined in the constitutions of countries, enshrined and proclaimed in the um, Bill of Rights and so forth, are actually uh, practiced? The root of migration in Guatemala, and this is something we say over and over again here uh, at the Bishops' uh, Conference, is poverty. That's the driver. And that uh, has to do, or that uh, is what happens in the country that expels migrants. Now, what uh, Luis Agarte says um, regarding the President's speech yesterday, we have to see, make sure that uh, what was said is actually uh, fulfilled and complied with. Well, thank you, Luis, for raising that point, because uh, from our Office of Human Movement, uh, we have to make sure that this actually um, happens. Now, the issue of deportation continues to afflict many people, people who die trying to get to the United States is always a story of pain and money from remittances. This is money that is uh, helping families overcome their uh, financial needs. And I'm not talking about the Guatemalan uh, economy, generally speaking, but the uh, specific family needs. I would like to point out something that concerns me about remittances, and that is the money that companies earn who transfer that money, that is the um, percentage that they take in these transfers, a percentage of every $100 sent, the systems uh, that make these uh, transfers possible, out of $100, they keep seven. That's their take. Now, just think about how much money these companies are making. Why don't governments intervene directly to uh, sanction these companies to ensure that part of that money can be invested in social development activities? Well, that's just an idea, and I float that here because I think together we can achieve better results. And I will conclude with this. I would just remind you what uh, the Catholic Church's policy ought to be, the actions it should carry out to a company to protect this migrant population, to integrate it, and to uh, foster it or promote it. Now, this goes for Catholics in the U.S. and Catholics uh, in Guatemala, and we have to continue uh, pushing for these uh, four verbs. Uh, Pope Fran Francisco continues to raise this because he's fully aware of the migration situation. My uh, wish is for this report to be broadly disseminated in our country. And to that effect, uh, I will put at uh, your service uh, the network of Catholic broadcasters to ensure that uh, this report reaches far and wide throughout Guatemala, this is a study that's not only interesting or worthwhile, but it's actually key for us to continue uh, raising awareness 
especially among those who have economic uh, and legal wherewithal. That's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cardinal Ramazzini, for your moving words. Now I would like to introduce you to Silvia Raquec, who is a uh, human rights defender against uh, violence, gender violence, and she coordinates the Folk No Migration Program, an organization helping people who are returned to reintegrate uh, into Guatemala society. We're talking about boys and children that uh, come from Mexico uh, and uh, U.S. Her work is very admirable. You have the floor, Sylvia. And before, I would just like to remind everyone, please, to write your questions in to the Q&A uh, section. Sylvia, you have the floor. The speaker speaking in an indigenous language as the interpreter. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much. To speak of migration, I do think that it's important to mention that migration, as uh, others uh, here have said, this is something that goes uh, runs throughout the history of mankind and people migrate for different reasons and the report uh, speaks to this and describes it quite clearly and uh, addresses some drivers that push people to leave their country. It's not that people are leaving because they want to, they are expelled by their communities. These are structural reasons, structural violence, uh, that is rooted in violence and discrimination, which plays out in poverty, extreme poverty that people experience and uh, that hits hardest indigenous populations. Being indigenous, being poor and to live in rural areas in Guatemala means not having uh, access to basic services such as healthcare, education, and these things are necessary to enjoy our rights and add to that if you are a woman or you face other adversities that makes people's situation that more difficult as far as uh, having full access to their rights but we can also talk about racism and discrimination also raised by other speakers i think that this is something that exists not just it's not something we want to see on at the source of uh, migration but throughout the uh, migration process. Now, as far as the path of migration, we see how indigenous people who no longer speak their maternal language, maybe they speak a bit of Spanish, they uh, are asked to sign documents they don't understand, and they are not provided with interpreters to ensure that their rights are upheld. According to statistics, most of the people who face this, most of the people who are emigrating from uh, Guatemala are indigenous peoples, and that's important not to forget. Now, violence, uh, which is perpetrated in part by the state by not ensuring or guaranteeing these minimum conditions, that is what in part leads to the conditions that ultimately lead people to seek out uh, other opportunities, a better lot outside of Guatemala. Now, we can also talk about generalized violence. Historically, the fact that uh, peoples have been stripped of their lands, forced to emigrate, and uh, Luis has also talked about how there are extract extractive industries that undermine people's rights and then communities uh, put up resistance against the extractive activities and that makes them a target and I shouldn't overlook persecution of human rights defenders, those who are defending people's land and right to the land. That's also something that the state is failing at. Instead of ensuring people's rights, it persecutes people and especially those people who are fighting against corruption. Now that's a regrettable situation because corruption is also a factor that leads to or is an implicit cause driving people to emigrate. Now our project of uh, 
integration of returnees, people tell us oftentimes how difficult it has been during the pandemic and also harvesting of coffee and other things that have uh, emerged in this report, the impact of climate change on the lives uh, in the community and hunger, which also drives people to leave Guatemala. And uh, the, the fact that people are very rooted in their communities bears mentioning people's decision to leave their families behind and to leave their identity behind in part is another important aspect, especially for women. Now, this is, this has an impact on people's lives because when we speak of how connected people are to Mother Earth, this goes beyond what we see or experience physically. This is a very strong connection and we have to try to understand this from the standpoint of how uh, practices and cosmovision of uh, indigenous people uh, are and how we uh, perceive this. And now when migrants uh, from our country go to the United States, uh, you can see this uh, because they continue with these practices, their dress, and uh, they establish networks of solidarity and mutual support. That by way of saying that no one should be forced to leave one's community, homes, territory, and identity. And so the report also uh, provides some very worthwhile input for us to understand this, to create a regular means of migration. And also to assist uh, returnees so that to, to ease uh, that uh, return process. And so hopefully this uh, report can be um, disseminated uh, across the communities and people will have access to it. Thank you, Sylvia. We've eaten up a, a bit of our time and now we're running against the clock. That means we're going to have to shorten the time allotted for Q and A. I'm going to address some of the questions that have come in and uh, I'll read them. Now, someone was asking the Cardinal to please repeat the four verbs used by Pope Francisco. I'd be pleased to. The verbs are to accompany, protect, integrate, and in that integration process to promote. That means when someone arrives at a country to uh, help to integrate that person in that new society and to promote that person's rights, human rights, that person's human rights. These are the four verbs. Thank you, Cardinal. Now, two questions I'm, uh, I'll combine in one. The fact that uh, democracy is being reduced and uh, the human rights agenda is also undermined in Guatemala, how does that have an effect on unauthorized uh, immigration or migration? And what is the effect of climate change on migration? Perhaps Juan Jose would like to take a stab at this. Yes, without a doubt, and we do see with much concern that uh, democracy is being undermined in Guatemala. Democratic venues are shrinking. There's a government that has essentially um, promoted impunity and corruption. And this sends a real bad message to the population. Let's not forget that there are subjective uh, reasons why people leave their country. And much of this has to do with hopelessness. And if a government doesn't instill trust, does not um, offer people any hope, people leave. And so we see that this uh, closing off of uh, democratic uh, venues or spaces promotes or drives people, makes people want to emigrate. Now, then you have repression and persecution against leaders and human rights defenders, uh, as Sylvia was saying. They uh, leave, not always as uh, migrants, but one way or the other. 
According to our public ministry, the Office of the Attorney General, uh, we've heard that a lot of these people are currently in the United States now. Climate change, it's not so clear what its change has been, but it's the dry corridor where there is much uh, famine, hunger, uh, where we see uh, the effect of climate change, droughts, storms, which also um, affects how people uh, their livelihood and uh, drives people to leave. Now, those people who didn't before think that they were capable of going to the United States, uh, someone uh, manages to uh, go to the United States before them, and then a network of support is created. And we see this now in those places uh, like Chikumula, for example, and uh, Bogotan, or other uh, areas where uh, emigration was not so common, but is becoming more common. Thank you. Perhaps Andrew will be the right person to answer the next question. Whose idea was it to uh, draft this report? Thank you very much, uh, Luis, if I'm not mistaken. IOM, I think. Uh, approach us to look into the possibility of undertaking this study in Guatemala with the support of USAID and Luis, you and I have always spoken about the possibility of working in Guatemala and I think in MPI, honestly, we know that many of the destination countries where migrants arrive, the US, Europe, Colombia, Costa Rica, those countries that have received many migrants. We know much about these countries. We know less about those countries, which are the source of migrants. Uh, that type of research, field research, had not yet been done. And you can't really understand the whole migratory process if you don't also look at the countries from which migrants come. And we are aware of that. And we knew Silvia and Juan Jose from other projects on reintegration in Guatemala. And so that's how we started this debate. I think in a couple of weeks, we put this idea for this project together. But as you said, Luis, one of the key issues is how uh, the, the importance of understanding uh, and, and hearing the migrants uh, explain themselves what their motivation for leaving their country is. There are things that come up. If you don't actually speak to people, you don't, you're don't. you not aware of it. The whole issue of rootedness is something you can overlook. That started to come up over and over again. And these are the nuances, the subtle things that you only learn by talking to people. You want to leave here? No, no. I, I don't want to leave. If I could come and go, that would be much better for me, they would say. And then, as we understood that, that started to change how we saw this. And climate change is another example. I remember this. If you ask people whether climate change is affecting them, they'll say no. But if you ask them, what about the rainfall patterns? And they'll tell you, and you'll start to see that rainfall is less... Um, predictable than it was in the past. It's a subtle change. And people go into debt before sowing their crops and then there's too much rain or there's a drought, then people in, in, uh, can't pay off their loans and they are indebted. And these are the aspects that we need to understand. Those of us here in Washington, it's very important for us to have this input of uh, the living voices of people to hear from them directly. This is a perfect uh, collaboration. They're on the ground. Uh, we're more in touch with the political agenda in that end of the research dynamic. And we started to put these two sides together, both of which are important for us to fashion good public policy. You can't try to do this without thoroughly understanding what people's motivation is. Thank you, Andrew. Now, here's a question directly for Silvia Raquek. 
you alluded to challenges that women face as far as um, their rights being upheld or for them to enjoy their rights. Are there any specific recommendations? Sylvia, are there any other sources beyond this report uh, that doesn't directly address this that can shed some light on this? The report, as you say, doesn't focus on this, but that is one of the findings that we had, how migration does have an effect on indigenous communities, especially the lives of women. There are some aspects. We can talk about a, a diagnosis that was done in Huetenango, which has given us some insight to what these drivers are, causes are that drive women to leave their communities. And there are some such as gender violence, domestic violence. So these are things we could talk about further, how we've uh, worked on this over the years in Huetenango also. We've looked on the differentiated impact that migration has on men and women women, usually speaking. Are the ones that hold tighter to their customs, customary practices. And they're also the ones that are more prone to suffer or be fall victim to acts of violence. Our territory isn't only the place where women live, it's the place where they are, where their bodies are raped. And so this isn't a topic addressed in this report, but we do have, we did uh, re find some revealing information uh, in doing this uh, research. There are many more questions. We only have 17 minutes. Uh, left, we will try to follow up on that later. Now, uh, a friend from Florida is uh, greeting, saying hello to Cardinal Alvaro Leonel Ramosini and uh, asks if there is a list of organizations that work on migration in Guatemala. Um, Juan, Jose, Juan Jose, could you please uh, give us uh, whatever information you have? Yes, there are uh, lists. There is a group which is a broad civil society uh, list of civil society organizations that to work in migration. There are networks in Mexico, a group on a migratory policy. Generally speaking, we do work uh, as a network on migratory issues, and this uh, gives us the opportunity to join efforts working with civil society organizations, and you see that uh, working together, there can be better coordination uh, across states. Here's another question, and I will ask Andrew to answer it. The emphasis placed on uh, temporary work visas doesn't really address the root causes of migration, and there are many a violations of workers' rights. What would you say about that? It doesn't solve the issue, but I think that any type of solution is a long-term issue. That is um, for, for people to have reasons not to migrate. Uh, now, there are things that can be done in the shorter term. We could talk about triggers, as we call them, uh, that address short-term issues, but ultimately, the solutions have to be long-term, how we handle migration in the short-term, mid-term, allowing for legal options, legal pathways. Now, there are always examples of the misuse of these programs and a, a, an imbalance uh, between employers, employers and employees. The, the same thing happens in Canada, H-2 uh, visas in uh, the US, and other options that aren't so closely tied to employers, but they still exist. And yes, there are many abuses committed against undocumented workers. 
we have to see how best to address these inequalities and abuses. The Ministry of Labor of Guatemala issued uh, rules, regulations on recruiting organizations. That's also very important. There have to be legal services provided by consulates for workers once they are in the country where they're working. Ultimately, it is important for there to be legal means. Other people, otherwise people are going to opt for the undocumented approach, and then it becomes that much more difficult to ensure people's labor rights are being upheld because they're off the radar, so to speak. Thank you, Andrew. Here's another question. As long as emphasis is placed on national security more than seeing migration as a tragedy, it's going to be very difficult for us to solve this situation. That was a comment more than a question. There is a question about whether the report addresses what drives young people and children to leave. And the answer I would say is no, but we estimate that in Guatemala, the number of students that graduate annually exceeds by far how many uh, jobs there are. And we talk about Huehuetenango. Migration, emigration is something that from uh, early childhood, kids are already thinking about uh, leaving the community even before they finish their studies. Now, this wasn't a question, but uh, estimates of the public ministry of Guatemala are that there are 3 million Guatemalans uh, roughly in the US. Now, this study says that it's uh, a million and a half Guatemalans. Now, how do we explain that discrepancy? What I've read is that the ministry says there are 3 million Guatemalans outside of Guatemala, most of whom are in the US, but there is a discrepancy in the overall numbers. And there's an under-reporting of COVID cases. The same thing happens there. Maybe Andrew or someone else has something they would like to add. The figures in the report come from the US census data. Certainly it's an undercounting but that's the closest we could get to being scientific. But I'm certain that there is an underreporting, undercounting, and the figures from the foreign ministry are most likely not accurate. These aren't formal, uh, this is informal census data. Whether the true figure is closer to one or the other, we don't know. Uh, out of abundance of caution, we uh, went by the census especially uh, as far as those who have recently arrived. And as for perhaps uh, my colleagues who know more about the figures, should factor in the recent uh, arrivees. Now there are a lot of people, even though a lot of people have been in the US for a long time, there are those who have arrived in the last five years and those are the ones that sometimes are overlooked in the census. Okay, so as a... Final question, somebody says that in Alta Verapaz, the situation is similar to that seen in Huehuetenango, but that the statistics for immigration are different. And they ask if you think there's a difference in the pull factors from the United States that would attract people from Alta Verapaz versus people from Huehuetenango. Would anybody like to weigh in? Yes. I think it's important to look at Huehuetenango's geographic location. It's bordering Mexico. And so there is a tradition of migration. And so the system of small holdings in Guatemala um, doesn't sustain people for the whole year. And so people in the Western Highlands have to work on farms on the Southern coast, but also on farms in the uh, coast of Mexico in Chiapas. And so there is a tradition of migration that has existed for years. 
But to that, we also have to add the creation of those family networks. And let's bear in mind that a large majority of migrants or refugees during the war uh, fled Huevetenango. And so what bears mentioning, and I said this at the beginning, is that there are departments like Alta Verapaz where there historically hasn't been hard, uh, very much migration and there is now migration. And so the push factor is present in both places and there are pathways being created for more people to migrate. And so uh, I wanted to point out about the prior question that counting of migration is never going to be accurate because people who migrate do so while attempting to hide themselves because this is a an act that is criminalized and as such they try to um, move furtively and so we know the number of people who are deported but it is certain that more people are traveling and so that's what i wanted to say thank you uh, thank you juan jose thank you to everybody and unfortunately we have to stop the question and answer period there are many excellent questions and observations that we will try to follow up on and uh, perhaps Claudio Santorum's or Anupama Rajaram's comments will address some of these. And so, Andrew, the floor is yours to introduce our final two panelists. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Luis, and thank you to all of our panelists. This was an extremely rich exchange. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Claudio Santorum, who is the chief of party for the program addressing root causes of migration from Guatemala on behalf of the International Organization for Migration. They are a great partner to MPI in many respects, but in this case in Guatemala where we can address this issue together. Claudio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrew. Good day to everybody. It's a pleasure to greet you from Guatemala. I would like to first praise the final product here and its methodology which required a review of existing data, conversations with experts, and what's been mentioned throughout this discussion, which is an in-depth study in four municipalities, Huevetenango, in with Huevetenango, which were already named by Luis. And so to paraphrase the study a bit, this propensity for migration is tied to existing contacts abroad. And so I would like to emphasize two other points. Poverty, as Cardinal Ramasini mentioned, and discrimination, as our colleague from Popnoi mentioned. And so let's look at the cumulative causation, which could also be this propensity that comes about from a short-term trip for various purposes, for example, buying land, starting a business, building a house, paying for children's schooling or paying off a debt. There are many pawn shops in some areas that shows that people are indebted and that the poverty that Cardinal Ramazzini uh, mentioned is a reality. Other push factors or triggers would certainly be family reunification, including a lack of safety as evidenced by the report. Uh, I started my current position in 2021 and we pointed out that while the crime rates are low in the highlands, there are land conflicts, there are conflicts over mega projects, there's also domestic violence and organized crime. This has already been discussed in terms of the limited presence of the state and public services. There are few schools and hospitals, the roads are poorly constructed and maintained. This is another thing that, that I tie into what our colleague Sylvia said, that certain groups are discriminated against or marginalized. 
Guatemala has the highest rate of land inequality on earth. And this comes from our study. The lack of services, and this was discussed throughout the discussion, could be due to the fact that the government collects less revenue, 10% of GDP. GDP. Uh, revenue is far less than remittances. Now, I was somewhat concerned to see in the draft reports that people, in reference to the feelings shared by subjects, that improvement financially is tied to migration, drug trafficking, or human trafficking, and not going to school or working in agriculture. And so our project's goal is to change this attitude. And I wanted to also clarify uh, a question that to which you responded, Andrew, asking who created this project. I don't know if they were talking about the project or the study. The project commissioned this study and the project is a joint venture between IOM and USAID. This was conceived of by both of these organizations and we continue to work jointly as a, a single team uh, until the project is completed. And so uh, some reflections based on the conclusions. I had some exposure to the topic before I assumed my current role. And I would say that the structural causes of migration would need to be addressed um, through for migration to be managed. I like that expression as it appears in the report. We would have to offer opportunities to Guatemalans, uh, we, including creating sources for work, like organic agriculture. But that has to also have uh, corollaries in the supply chain. Our project would seek to address that. So instead of extractive industries that exploit the environment, the project is hyper-local in its focus. The project or the, the study, of which I manage. So this hyper-localization led us to create four local offices, El Quiche, San Marco, Quetzaltenango, and Huevetang. There were uh, many sub-grants that include both indigenous peoples and women. And so seven of these sub-grants were exclusively earmarked for these issues. We focus on vulnerable groups. Young people, girls, women, and native people deserve our focus. And so we have a position that is devoted exclusively to uh, guidance on indigenous matters for which we chose a Pocoma Mayan woman and another woman who is Ichil, who has been chief of party for Quiche. And so in conclusion, we have an updated, it's essential to have updated data in a database for carrying out these efforts. This was addressed by, this was a question that was read by Luis and answered by Juan Jose. And so this research, this database is important for us both qualitatively and quantitatively. And we are already hard at work 
in our research unit with this data. And so that is all I have to say, and thank you very much. Thank you, Claudio. And regarding the genesis of all of this, IOM and USID, I am very happy to present Anupama Raju Rajamaran. We know her as a mission director for USAID in Guatemala. Anu has over 20 years of experience in USAID. It's been my pleasure to know her throughout different times in her career, and I can uh, vouch for her great talent. She's one of the best people at USAID. And so go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrew, for such kind words. Mayan greetings. Uh, good day to everybody. And thank you very much for inviting me. It's great to be here with all of you to participating in so valuable and productive a dialogue. And I've taken a lot of notes about the comments that all of the panelists have made and also comments made by the audience. This has been a very rich discussion. Thank you to Migration Policy Institute, IOM, Popno, uh, and to all of our panelists and experts, Cardinal Ramassini, Silvia, Andrew, Luis, everybody. It's a true pleasure to be here with you. And as far as USAID, we are one part, one component in a broader strategy that includes other agencies and departments of the United States government to advance the Biden-Harris administration's goals, which are captured in the strategy for addressing the root causes of unauthorized migration in Central America, or the root causes strategy, for short, which is also a strategy for collaborative migration management. The U.S. government recognizes that migratory challenges are complicated and have multiple causes, and as such, our strategies address immigration holistically, both in the medium and the long term. The findings that were shared in today's sessions are a clear example of the complexity of migration. I would like to share some statistics. There are many Guatemala experts here among us, but I think it's important to highlight some statistics that show Guatemala's particular context. First, around 80% of the Guatemalan population lives in poverty. In the Western Highlands, including Huehuetenango, Guatemala has the sixth highest rate of chronic malnutrition in the world. One out of every two Guatemalan children under five are malnourished. Second, Guatemala is one of two countries in the region uh, that is has the youngest population. 61% of the population is under the age of 30. And so there is a large population of young people who need opportunities, who need hope. And those Guatemalan young people with an average of only six years of schooling are not properly prepared for the labor market. And the third statistic that I would like to share is that every year, 150,000 young people in Guatemala enter the labor force and compete for only 35,000 jobs that are created every year. So there is a great lack of economic opportunity in this country. And so in light of these statistics, it should not surprise us that more than 80% of the population are Guatemalans who choose to migrate do so for 
economic reasons for better pay, better jobs. And as we've heard from all of our panelists today, and as that video so compellingly showed us, uh, they're also driven by their basic needs. But aside from economic considerations, we also know that governance is a key issue. For example, some surveys that we have supported have shown us that the possibility of or the propensity to migrate is 70% higher among Guatemalans who have been the victims of corruption. And so the lack of governance or the absence of the state um, can affect the labor market because corruption or the absence of the state or the lack of rule of law can impede the creation of jobs because the government has not been able to provide basic services in large parts of the country in terms of education, water, roads, and infrastructure. And so I would like to now give a summary of USAID's action in addressing the root causes of irregular migration or unauthorized migration, including some key points of our country strategy and our country program's focus. First, we are investing in better understanding who is migrating and why they are migrating. The report that you have shared today is a clear example of our attempts to understand the fluid migratory dynamics at a local level. According to the statistics that we received from IOM, among other sources, we know that the majority of Guatemalan migrates, migrants are young people, they are male, and they are primarily from vulnerable regions of the country, specifically the Western Highlands. Additionally, we continue to support quantitative and qualitative surveys to not only understand why people migrate, but also what factors drive them to stay in their communities. Some surveys that we carried out recently revealed to us that perceptions among Guatemalans or that there are perceptions among Guatemalans that you can earn between 12 and 20% more working in the United States and that the chances of succeeding if people choose to migrate is between 80 and 90%. And so it's not surprising to see migrant flows at such high levels as we are, given our current situation. Second, our country strategy here in Guatemala prioritizes three key populations, indigenous peoples, young people, and women. And thus, our model here prioritizes partnerships. We recognize that we can't do anything on our own. We partner with the government at the central and the local level, civil society organizations, and more importantly, communities themselves to be able to create opportunities for the populations that are most likely to migrate and connect those populations to concrete specific opportunities here in their home country, jobs, education, vocational training, better services, among other things as well. So this focus seeks to redirect the migratory flows outside the United States and toward internal orderly migration to intermediate cities in Guatemala, especially those that hold out uh, much economic potential. As Andrew and others uh, have said, we are also broadening our support to the Guatemalan Labor Ministry to assist in the expansion, the temporary work program to offer 
more opportunities for Guatemalans to work in the United States on a temporary basis. And we think that this is something that can be a win-win situation for both countries. Now, the third item in our strategy is that our focus is mostly community-based. We have learned that we can't only focus on individual incentives. We have to recognize the role of local communities to have an influence on people's decisions uh, to migrate, families, uh, friends, community leaders. This is a key aspect of this new program, addressing the root causes for migration uh, as implemented by a very uh, valuable partner, IOM. This approach, and I don't, we don't have much time left, but this approach shows our commitment which is to localize development. That's my final point. And we spoke about the importance of working uh, with local actors. And this is a priority of our uh, director, Ms. Power. Last November, USAID, our administrator, Power, launched an initiative called local Central America. This is an initiative that seeks to involve, uh, to finance, encourage local organizations to implement development uh, projects in different sectors. And as a part of this localization of development, we are bolstering our association or ties with indigenous communities leaving behind this, behind this uh, relationship of donor and recipient country to strike up a true partnership based on trust and prior consultation in which together we can set priorities for the community, the community's priorities, focusing on specific activities that are in line with shared priorities. Let's change the way we interact with local or we have changed the way we interact with uh, local actors we are translating our applications and in some into some of the indigenous languages making available other um, means of communication beyond internet such as radio in many mayan languages to help people understand how to interact with USAID and we also listen to local actors to inform the decisions we make and so we are trying to revolutionize our model so that we have a stronger and more authentic and genuine relationship and interaction with uh, local actors across sectors. Now, this goes to show how USAID is uh, taking a holistic approach uh, to tackle these challenges of migration in Guatemala by providing more information that is evidence-based, based on uh, what we have learned, economic adaptation, working with uh, prioritized groups with a community approach and partnerships with local organizations that are sound, solid, committed to the development of Guatemala. We trust that our joint work, working with many of these organizations we've spoken of today, will create greater opportunities locally for Guatemalans to have safe, dignified uh, lives in their own communities in Guatemala. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anu, and I thank everyone who has listened in today. We thank you very much, and hopefully we can follow up uh, with this. And I thank the Popnok colleagues for their taking part uh, in this event with us. I thank uh, IOM, USAID, for this partnership. I thank Luis and everyone else, all the speakers in today's presentation 
Thank you very much and uh, let's stay in touch.